Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the book he showed you, I'm exceedingly proud. That that came out in 16, and um, so uh, Auburn played a big part in that, in that the Grand National was the fourth site, and um, Mr. Jones said it was one of the prettiest sites he ever had for any of his almost 500 courses. It just kind of varies, but somewhere around 500 courses that he'd worked on all around the world during his career, and you got to remember he was uh, 84 years old in 1990 when he came to start that project. So um, I'm just going to give you a little briefing on who, who that is, what it is, why, and then I want to get into uh, a little bit about National Village. And it's all kind of centered around the retirement systems of Alabama. And so I'm just going to tell you a little bit about them, because without them and Dr. Bronner, none of this would have been possible. So basically, what, I, what you need to know here is it's 354,000 members, 212,000 active members, 141,000 retired, and there's the, te the teacher's retirement system has 308 units, and the uh, employee's retirement system has 1,009 units, and they also have a judicial fund, judicial retirement fund, all the judges, uh, supernumeraries, and et cetera. Revenue for RSA in 2017, $6.6 .6 billion from three sources, employer contributions, employee contributions, the employers are basically the state and the municipalities, employee contributions, and investment income. So most of their income every year is from investments. But let me tell you, they have four, almost $42 billion in 23 funds. And Dr. David Bronner, uh, well, let me just go on to say that uh, they paid out $3.2 billion in benefits last year, with $2.8 billion of that going to Alabama, because most of the people that retire here stay here. Um, and, of course, they're invested in 24 countries in stocks, bonds, real estate, and securities. But they have 25% of their private placement is in Alabama. It's the Golf Trail Office Buildings Manufacturing. So these are economically targeted investments designed to have certain economic benefits, such as job and tax revenue creation, in addition to a responsible return. So, so Dr. Bronner came to Alabama in uh, 1973, and the whole system had 112,000 members at that time, and they were paying $40 million in benefits per year. And I just showed you they paid $3.2 billion last year. So... He, the fund had $500 million in assets. 1973, George Wallace was governor. 45 years later, they're at $42 billion. So, um, and these are, most of those green roofs, I'll come back to that. So, basically, they have a lot of office buildings in Montgomery, Mobile, and New York. Let's, we'll just move through these kind of quickly. This 55 water building right here, and there's, it's that part, it's a, Vietnam Veteran Plaza, like Memorial Park, and then there's an elevated acre over here, and this is the East River. So, and it, it was very close to the World Trade Towers, but uh, opened in 72. RSA purchased it in 93, something like 27 cents on the dollar, and um, they spent money on it, got it retrofitted, and now it appraises anywhere from $1.8 billion to $2 billion, and it's paid for, and it's got over 4 million square feet of lease space, and it's leased for uh, 20 years. And they got people like uh, McGraw-Hill, you know, Standard & Poor's, New York, system, New York City Retirement System, Hugo Boss, whatever. So that's cash flow that comes in, and um, it's one of the better investments. But... Um, couple other pictures on that. That shows up a lot. It's 55 stories. 13,000 people work in that building. It's got 85 elevators in it. And it's own generator system. And they never, it never, it's never without power. When her, you know, when, unless, when Hurricane Sandy hit it, it did, it, did, it got flooded and lost the whole 
power system, but they, they moved it up a few floors. They had it down in the basement and they moved it up. So, uh, but now, trade, most of the NASDAQ trades go through there, and if the, if the power goes off to the building, the generators kick in fast enough that it never slows down, never, you know, has a, a mess. But anyway, just a little side thing. So there's another look at 55 water. The, this is Montgomery. These are the buildings in Montgomery that are, there's over a billion dollars worth of buildings right there that got started in 1992. And um, these are just some of their buildings. This is their headquarters. And this is their criminal justice center that was a hospital they refurbished. They've got this union building over here. They've got the Center for Commerce. They've got seven parking decks. Well, another one you can't see here. They've got this RSA Tower. This data center right here has an internet exchange. One of the uh, uh, four, one of four in the south. And um, RSA building here, that was the first building they built. And then there's a plaza here. So, um, and then this shows the headquarters and the criminal justice building. This building is now post-secondary education. Now, the point is they lease all this space out to state agencies primarily and some commercial agencies. But uh, they help, by having these buildings, they help make the state government more efficient. And there's their headquarters. That's a real nice building. And there's Commerce Center brought all the agencies that deal with commerce together, development office, Department of Economic Community Affairs, universities had offices, a power company, et cetera. So it made it a whole lot easier to do business to recruit industry. This, this encapsulates those Supreme Court buildings, so they were able to preserve it. And it's a, it's a secure data center there with racks and racks of servers that, that, that they've run in there. Um, this is in Mobile, and it started out, they bought this Battle House Hotel there which was an old hotel that uh, Alan probably remembers since he's from Mobile. Bought it, started refurbishing it, built this tower, which is now the tallest building in the state. Went across the road and bought this building and made it Class A space. That's the old uh, Am South building. It's now called RSA Trustmark building. Came down here and bought the old Van Antwerp building. They had already bought this Adams Mark Hotel and they turned it into the Riverview Renaissance Riverview with a walkway over here to the convention center. They financed a cruise ship terminal, brought in a cruise ship, and basically helped refurbish downtown Mobile. That shows a little bit more of those, a little different view of those buildings. So let's take it back to the golf trail, back to 92. And there's Jones, uh, Toby's new be our old best friend, I'm gonna say. There's Dr. Bronner. And um, that's me. His communications guy, Dr. Bronner, looked at that and said, is that your son? I said, I said no, but that's my daddy. He said, that's my daddy too. But anyway, uh, so uh, Roger Rulich did most of the work. Jones helped a lot. He still looked at the greens, and he liked to make molds of greens. He was really... You know, he came up with these three different uh, parts to the green or quadrants, whatever you want to call it, with humps. And, you know, if you weren't in the right area, putting over, putting around, y'all have done that. Well, it's sort of his trademark. So there they are looking at some in Oxmoor Valley in 1990. That was the first site. So they ended up with uh, 11 sites on the trail, started in 1990. And first seven were built up to about 94, and then 99, uh, they came, came he, he found a site in Prattville that he really liked. And, um, and then they bought the Grand Hotel down in Point Clear. And it had two courses. They refurbished those. Then they went up to uh, the Shoals and built two holes, and, uh, excuse me, two 18-hole uh, courses. Then they went to Ross Bridge, which very close to uh, Oxmoor Valley over there in sort of West Birmingham. So now they have 72 holes with a, a large resort hotel. Now, four of these, uh, five of these sites are marketed nationally. They get national uh, people coming in from all over, and that's Grand Hotel, uh, Grand National, 
Capitol Hill, Ross Bridge, Birmingham, and the Shoals. And then regionally, they get, uh, Mobile gets a lot of people from Mississippi, a few people coming from other states. Uh, up here in Huntsville gets Tennessee and some Georgia. And then they call local, more of a local draw is Silver Lakes and Dothan and Greenville. So um, just, you know, real quickly, I will tell you this. They didn't pay anything for any of the land when they built these courses. Okay, you say, what? Yep. 5,700 acres of golf courses, and the, de the land was either deeded fee simple by a developer, or it was leased for a dollar a year for 50 years with three 10-year options. And uh, like the one out at Grand National was leased from the Opelika Water Board. I mean, that's, that 600-acre Lake Saugahatchee uh, was a really good site. So uh, different companies. Here in Birmingham, U.S. Steel had 8,000 acres out there, not far from downtown Birmingham. Well, this sort of opened all that up once they got in there. So this is Magnolia Grove down in Mobile. The uh, city of Mobile leased land for that. Hampton Cove's in Huntsville, donated by the Hayes family up there, 650 acres. Uh, Long Mountain Views. Each of these sites uh, are different. Dr. Brunner wanted to cover the entire state, and as you know, you go from one to the other, it's almost eight hours, and we have mountains, rivers, lakes, jungle, coastal, uh, live oak trees down at the, so he wanted to feature all the topography, and his task was to find the canvas so Mr. Jones could do his work. Um, this is out here at Grand National. That is one fine piece of property there. I'll tell you that much. Silver Lakes. No, excuse me. This is in Dothan. This is up at uh, Cambrian Ridge. That is an unusual piece of property for South Alabama. If you've, if you've ever, if you've never been there, and you're going to, and the reason they put it there, it was halfway between Birmingham and Mobile. And he was, he want, if he was going to market a golf trail to California and around the country and the world, it had to be close enough that you could get to it. So he wanted a site within two hours of each other, you know, within 10 minutes of an interstate. Well, he went down to Greenville not expecting to find much and drove up and they got out there on that property. And he immediately said, okay, we need to put the clubhouse up here, you know. But if you've not been there, it's, four, it's about four miles off the interstate. Just take it one day and drive out there and go look off the back of that clubhouse. You can see for about 30, 35 miles. Get you a sandwich and go sit out there, even, you know, and just do that for me. Uh, this is Silver Lakes. This was a tree line course, and the EF3 hurricanes that came through in 2011 took out 38,000 trees. Wow. Now, some of them weren't very big, but it turned it into a lynx course for a lot of it. But it's, you know, but they put it back. He could have closed it, but he didn't do it. He spent the money, put it back. I mean, it ripped up wiring for the sprinkler system and all kinds of stuff. Yes, Adam. Mark, tell them the names of the three courses. Oh, heartbreaker, backbreaker, and mindbreaker. <laughs> <laughs> they don't call them that for nothing either. Now, this is in this is Capitol Hill over there. This was like a this thing here was a cotton field. That was a cotton field. The guy they bought the land from. Told, told Dr. Bronner, all right, if, that, if this golf course fails, I'm going to buy my uh, cotton field back. <laughs> Bronner, I was with him. We played that course uh, about two weeks ago, and he told that story again. He said, and you get out there, you can't see one, you can't see one fairway from the other. They move so much dirt. And he said, good luck with him planting cotton out here, you know. <laughs> anyway, a little side thing. So here's, this is, there's three beautiful courses over there, 318 hole. You go out. Three different doors, three different, uh, completely different golf courses. That judge, you don't even know you're in Alabama and in parts of that thing down there. Um, Lakewood, at the Grand Hotel, it's this part. I'll tell you a little more about that. And uh, history on the eastern shore of Mobile Bay of tourism. There's been, a, since 1820, there's been some sort of a hotel on this, on or around this property over here. And I'll tell you a little more about that. But now they, there's 36 holes there. And so this is up in the shows. Uh, across from Turtle Point, where 
Mr. Harvey Robbins donated this property. Well, his dad donated the property for Turtle Point across the Wilson Lake over there. And so this is Ross Bridge. Uh, so this is what Grand Hotel looked like when, uh, this is it actually what it looks like now. Uh, they built, when Do RSA bought it in 59, $30 million, built this spa building and refurbished their conference center and added, got it up to 405 rooms, moved the swimming pool over here, and in 2000, they opened it up probably 03. Well, in 2005, Hurricane Katrina came through there, ripping right up the bay, just trashed the place, $50 million worth. But they, they had $50 million in insurance, thank goodness, and they put it back in, and they just finished a $35, $35 million renovation. They'd renovated every room. They took these buildings. Th this was like the Marina building and the uh, North Bay House, South Bay House, and the main hotel. And they uh, took those down to the block walls. Tot if you haven't been down there lately, they totally redid it. They changed the restaurants and... So it's now an autograph collection. They moved it up a notch from just a Marriott Resort. And, uh, you know, I, I don't know what to say about that. They didn't ask me about it. But, uh, of course, this is out here. This was 03, and they just added 100 rooms out here. And I'm staying out there tonight. I was out there earlier. And, that, and a spa. So it's about, as soon as that spa opened, just about to become a Marriott Resort but gives them 100 extra rooms, and it, you know, it's tied into the golf course and National Village, and they built those tennis courts and pickleball courts over there. Of course, this is over at Capitol Hill, right at, at Prattville. They have this hotel conference center that's there. This is the hotel down in Mobile. This is the one in the Shoals. When they got up there, this tower was sitting there. That's about, I don't know, 22 stories high, and it rotates, but it wasn't working and birds were in there when he got it. They got him up there, and so there was a conference center already there. That conference center was just looking down, and it wasn't doing anything. It was dead, the tower was dead, and they said, please help us. He said, all right, I'll, you know, the state paid for this tower. We'll get that deeded to the retirement systems, lease me that conference center, I'll build a hotel there, and across the river, we'll build a 36-hole golf course. Y'all ready to go? I mean, it happened about, that's about how it goes with him when he's working right. So that's Ross Bridge. The housing at Ross Bridge is just unbelievable, the way that came up. Battle House Hotel, really a nice property. Uh, inside, they totally refurbished it and restored it. If you've not been in down there, go to Mobile and go in that place. It's, it's just a treat. And then this is the one over Montgomery. They got the Performing Arts Center. It's as nice as anything on Broadway. And um, they, the other thing that made this thing happen was that in 96, he started buying media companies. And he ended up with uh, $3 billion worth of Raycom television stations and community newspapers, which somewhere around 50 television stations 12% of the market, and 125 newspapers. But the key was he got $50 million a year in free advertising for the state of Alabama. The budget by the state tourism agency to promote Alabama was $1.2 million before that. So that's what got this, made this thing successful. So I'll tell you that uh, they averaged somewhere 500, 550,000 rounds a year, and over half of those are coming from people from out of state. So it's really increased, increased the tourism in Alabama from somewhere around $3 billion to over $14 billion a year. Tourism is, is a very big industry in the state now. Now, this is the American Association of Retirement Communities, and this is, the, this is a photo of Grand National, it was taken in October 16, and you can see the, the golf courses over here, the lake, and then this is the retirement housing that's coming in over there, National Village, I need to move that. But there's the hotel, and so 
you, the way these are set up, you get uh, your property owner's association dues, get you access to the pool and the, uh, all that stuff over here at the hotel, and it gets you uh, some privileges on the golf course. Plus, it gives you all your lawn maintenance. Does anybody here live out in National Village? Okay. Yeah, Alan does. I mean, I'm basically covering it. You could probably tell them more about that than I, I, I can. But it, it's really, uh, but here's the point. I wanted, to, I wanted to talk about this and another one that they have in um, uh, Point Clear that's called the Colony. So, so RSA has two planned resorts that were kind of like get the golf trail, then build those eight hotels, give them something to stay, give them something to play, give them somewhere to stay so they'll want to come. And then it, once they come, get them to live here. Just go ahead and just build, let them build them a house, okay? So, um, um, so this community, I, we just got, got them certified as a, with a seal of approval from the American Association of Retirement Communities, and they don't, nobody really knows that much yet, Alan. We just got that word back. But we're, it's going to be coming out. So, and if you go and talk, I talked to the people out there today, they're going to these smaller cottages, Retirees want three bedrooms, two baths. They can have an office. If they're married, they can, each one of them can have a bedroom. If one of them's sick or gets a little cold or something, snoring too much. Or, and then they each got a you know, bathroom. Or if somebody comes in to help stay with them, whatever, you got an extra. So that's what they're looking for. They don't want a whole lot of stuff to maintain as they get on towards 70. And they got the money. They don't want to tie up all their money in the house. So they're, they're going for those smaller properties. Uh, so let me just go through. This is what it looked like. This, this slide came from Roger Rulwich in 91, and this is when they first started clearing that property out there. And for my book, Roger gave me all the slides, and, in, and when he gave them to me, I mean, I'm talking about slides that had to be converted to digital images, and um, I took them in to Walmart to get their photo people, to, and they were still in slide trays. I had them in some slide trays. And the girl, what is that? <laughs> That's a slide tray. I said, this is a slide. I said, you know when you do it on a computer where you do PowerPoint, it says slide show? That's where this came from. So they're like, oh, I did, I've never have seen one of those. But uh, so anyway, th th this, but this site is, you know, there's old Patrick Fane Dye. Y'all may have heard of him before when they announced this place. And uh, back in 91, and there's Jones and uh, Mayor Bobby Freeman. Anybody know? Anybody from Opelika? He's gone now. He doesn't live here anymore, but heck of a guy. That's Mayor Fuller when he was on the council. So um, here again, this is a little bit about what it looked like. And they just got in here and, I mean, they would get nine, uh, five D9 bulldozers on the site because they were trying to build those things as fast as they could. They said when they announced that Dothan site and they showed up down there, it looked like an invasion of Kuwait down there. Just because the way they bid these jobs, like they would say to the, in this company called Phillips and Jordan, I had the second most um, Caterpillar equipment besides uh, Saudi Arabia. And they're out of Memphis, Tennessee, and they said, how much will you charge us to move this dirt? And they go, well, how much dirt are we going to have to move? And they said, we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> because they allowed Mr. Jones and Roger to design, once they picked the sites, they gave them leeway as to how they designed the hole, which is ideal for a golf course architect. They could go out there and they could say, no, I didn't know that tree was so nice. No, we got we got to save that tree. We got to play over here more. So we're going to move this one. We're going to move this center line. You know, we're going to do this. This is this ravine, and getting out there and actually shaping it as they went. They love that, as opposed to we got to get 400 houses in here. Get these 400 houses laid out, and then whatever's left, we'll build a golf course. That wasn't what they were looking for. So the way they bid that stuff out was. They said, how much are you going to charge us to run your, 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 all your bulldozers 24 hours a day, seven days a week, as long as the weather permits? That's what we want. We don't, you know. 
because we don't know how much we're going to have to move. But um, there's old Dr. Bronner over here when they're working on a um, uh, real quick funny story. So he came over here and, and um, brought Bobby Vaughn, this guy right here, was president of Sunbelt Golf, and they were, had been looking at sites, and he was looking around, and, and Mayor Freeman was telling me this story, and so they, he, they, it was down, they were out there in July or August, and it was hot, and it was about 1.30 in the afternoon, and they were walking up and down. They rode out there in a little boat, and they were walking up and down, and, you know, they couldn't get through some of this stuff, and that was bugs and everything you want to think of. So they got back in the they got back in the boat and rode back up to town. He hadn't said much, so he got in. The, he walked in the mayor's office and he said, "You got a pad?" Mayor said, "Sure." Hand him a pad and he said, "He started writing." He said, "All right, I need a survey. I need a title. I need so and so. I need the thing on that water tank. I need such and such." And get me all that within three weeks, and we'll get the deal put together. And the mayor and the city planner said, "Oh." Uh, Will you go through that again? He said, no, y'all have been listening. He said, well, can we get your notes? He said, y'all have been writing. He said, let's go, Bobby. And so they pieced it together. But what happened was the, the mayor said he, he was the best guy ever to do business with. If he ever told you, whatever he told you, he would do it. And he would get it done. And so uh, one time the mayor called him. They, they'd been jacked around by this, these lawyers for, uh, because of one of the water tanks. They need to carve out a little part of, a little parcel out of the property over there. They couldn't get the lawyers down there to do title work. They kept waiting. So he just called Dr. Bronner's office one day, and that's when you know, mostly line phones everybody used back in the early 90s. So I can just see it. He gets Dr. Bronner on the phone. Hello. He said, yeah, well, can you please get uh, so-and-so, those attorneys from Birmingham to come up here? Yeah, hold on. Get so and so on the phone for me, and you know this, it's a company that's closed bi millions of dollars of bond deals for him. All of a sudden, he had the principal on the phone. Hey, will you get down there and get that title work done in Auburn? Okay, thanks. They'll be down there tomorrow. <laughs> I mean, you know, stuff like that. That's what, and that's what the mayor he got the biggest kick out of that kind of stuff. The bridges they built out there are tremendous, you know. And uh, that signature hole there, if you ever played, you got to hit across that thing. That thing's, this is just the clubhouse. There's old Jones out there. And that hurricane, much like today, came up through here in the late 90s. I don't know if y'all remember that, but it took down a bunch of trees out there. That several thousand trees got knocked down. I don't, it might have been Hurricane Opal. Was that it? A day kind of like today, man, except instead of turning toward Georgia, this thing came rip, ripping up through here. And so the, the, the golf course, they, couldn't get, they had to get helicopters to fly those trees out because they couldn't tear up their courses, you know. And they got prison guards to come over here and help. But that's just the truth. Um, so now for three years in a row, they had the Barbasol Championship, and I got to play in the Pro-Am. I was sad they lost that. That was fun. That was really good. And that was the same week that they played the British Open. The show ponies went to the, play the British Open, and the other guys that hadn't won in a while showed up over here. But there's old, excuse me, that was old Angel, Masters Champ, and Stuart Appleby from. La and then the last time I, I saw Davis Love played up here and whatever. This is that hotel under construction back in the day. There's a little aerial show, and, and now they added 100 rooms right here in a spa building down here. Now, this is when those tennis courts were under construction. Uh, this housing, they're, they're moving up. Now they got housing up here around these, these lake holes. Lake, this is the lake course up here, and they've got golf view sites up through here and some bigger lots uh, that they're working on. I'll give you the rundown on that in just a minute. But this is a little more out at National Village and what's going on out there. Uh, I love the way they did this wallpaper in the rooms. I really like that. And um, so in each room, you know, I don't know, but they're, it's not just the same scene in every room. It's different. <laughs> Say what now? Hey. <laughs> so these are some of the, and I just took a bunch of new pictures uh, this morning, but they're not on here. But this is... Um, 
you know, they got fishing out there. They got these little things. And, and anybody that loves Auburn University that lives out there, there you see Auburn flags all over the place. And um, uh, it's, they got those ten, over 10 miles of walking trails. And they got about three lakes in addition to the big lake. And now, but before we do that, let me tell you this much. To date, they have sold 191 houses out there Grant at National Village. They have 15 spec homes in various stages of construction now, and they have 91 lots ready. So they're, they're moving ahead. Uh, this is a little book I wrote, and it's on site, it's online if you go to nationalvillage.com. It's just a, it's all about National Village. And it ties in Auburn University. It's everything to do over here at the university. You know, like Alumni House and the Raptor Center and the uh, sports, the new basketball coliseum, the football games, soccer, baseball. I mean, Auburn's a great town, you know, and, and Auburn, Opelika's got all the history, and both those, and the place has grown so much over here. Every time I come in and out of here, I get amazed at all the new stuff. And it's close to the interstate, close to Atlanta, Atlanta Airport, not far from Montgomery. It's uh, got a good hospital out there in Opelika. So that place, you know, really got a lot going for it. Uh, this is down at the Colony, and I showed you that, I don't know what happened on this, but Somehow there was a cloud or something got right there. But this is, I've shown you the, the hotel park. Well, they got two, eight, two 18 hole courses and they went in, went in here and bought this lake. And so they've started, they, they bought this, uh, there was a con they built a condo there that has 56 units on it. And they built this aquatic center and tennis court facility there with a, it also has a fitness center and a restaurant. And then they started building houses around the lake. And this was as of December. So now they're cutting roads in here and they're coming, coming on here and they bought more property out in here. They can't build these houses fast enough. And she told me today that they had, they've got about nine under construction for people who've already signed contracts for out there. They, they can't get them built fast enough. They're, some of them are not gonna be in by Christmas. You know, people move in right now if they could get them, but they can't. So th this is, uh, that's the high rise there and um, it's an aquatic center that's down there, and that's Mobile Bay out there. You can see that that's from the top of that high rise, and uh, they, it's separated, you know, adult area, and they got hot tub, and they got this lazy river and slide, so uh, kids, grandkids like it a lot there. And, there's, and then these are some of the houses down there. Okay, there's that book that I've mentioned now. Uh, and I also have a book on um, the colony, and this is on the website. If y'all, you know, this one's colony at the and these are on. And uh, let me tell you something else. I retired from Jacksonville State. I stopped teaching. I worked up here 32 years, and I was head of the department for sociology and social work. And I stopped teaching there in 2012 because I helped, I did a lot on that golf trail. Um, as Alan said, I did most of the projected economic impact studies to help, to help, the, for instance, the Opelika Water Board decide, do we want to be in on, on this? What kind of impact are we going to get out of this? Is it worth us leasing our property for basically uh, nothing? or if I'm a developer in Birmingham, giving our property, donating it. But um, the, the point was with those developers, if they had, like in, up here in uh, Silver Lakes, the developer had a thousand acres up there, out in the middle of nowhere in Glencoe, Alabama. I mean, it, it was kind of in the sticks. People thought Dr. Brown was crazy if they wanted to go build a 36-hole golf course out there. There were no hotels you know, like eight, eight or 10 miles from Anniston, eight to 10 miles from Gadsden, eight or 10 miles from Jacksonville. So the developer, I said, look, he wants 400 acres. <laughs> I don't want to tell him this. He, he wants 400 acres, and, but 
He's going to build a 36-hole world-class golf course there. And that means your other 600 acres are going to be worth a whole lot of money. Instead of this $2,000 an acre right now, you're going to, you're going to, you know, it's going to be good stuff. So it's kind of a no-brainer. And mo any developer, most developers I know, Toby might agree, would not want to have to build a golf course and run a golf course. They'd rather build and sell houses. So for somebody to come in and say, we'll build it, we'll operate it, I mean, that's like a, when can we, when can we get started? So, um, so I, I wrote articles about it. I watched every site roll out, and I visited them. I negotiated for three of the sites, uh, helping them get the final arrangements all worked out. Uh, the one in the Shoals, and we tried to build one in Orange Beach that didn't get built. It was going to be a 54-hole site right there near the state park, and it was beautiful, and, um, but it didn't get built because there was another developer that wanted to build an 18-hole course and 600 houses, and there was a lawsuit involved, and so that one didn't go. But not long after that, Dr. Bronner bought, the retire bought, bought that Grand Hotel, so it's, it's kind of had a happy ending down there. Well... Um, so I knew, so I kept up with all that stuff, and I kept up with the clips, and it took me three years to get that book compiled and published. And I knew when I retired I was going to do that. So I went down there at Fairhope, and I did that. And all through the years, my research has been on retirees and retirement communities and retiree migration. And see, we were actually doing that before the trail, and that's one of the reasons Dr. Brunner decided to do the trail, was to attract retirees. And if you say, where'd you come up with that? And he'd say, ah, something Fagan and them came up with at Jackson State. So we'd been, you know, we'd been pushing that, promoting that. So I knew, and I thought, man, I had studied a lot of retirement places. So I knew, and I'd always liked Fairhope, because I just visited a lot and been to Gulf Shores a lot, and so... So I, I wanted to write this book called Coastal Alabama Retirement Guide. And it's about Fairhope, or excuse me, Baldwin County and Mobile County. And so I like to put pictures in. I like to try to create images when I write. So I find that images, just like when I talk, I, I just like to give, uh, I like to talk about it, but I like to show, I'm a big guy on evidence. And you, you know, you don't know the economic impact well, I could show you a picture of Dothan before I could show you the site, and then I could show you the golf course and the houses afterwards. So that's kind of hard to argue with that. So, um, so I said, you know what? This thing here, and so I get into, on this one, I get into um, introduction of retire, uh, to retirees and retirement areas, basic information about coastal Alabama, real estate, health care, outdoor recreational attractions, cultural attractions and festivals, and then a summary with a bibliography. And, and on all of them, I include websites. So this is almost like, a, um, and I, this was after living down there five years, visiting all these places, taking these pictures and just researching it. I mean, I, I'm, I'm a researcher, basically. So... So this is like a hundred brochures in one, okay? When I was doing this, I started, I kept getting into the history of Mobile County and Baldwin County. I find the older I get, the more I like history. And I never really liked it that much in undergraduate school, but I mean, I knew I had to pass it, so you get your spoon out and you do it, right? Well, I just really got fascinated with uh, the Mobile Bay like for instance, right here, this is the shipping channel in Mobile Bay. Have y'all been to Mobile Bay? Anybody ever been down there? Okay. Um, at one time, that bay was um, was a riverbed, and the Mobile River was one of the main rivers, and and so it was like a river valley, and and the coast was 65 to 70 miles further south. And then the ice started melting and the water started coming up. Well, they found, and it's well documented, a cypress forest. And the wet wood was well preserved. This has been in the last two to three years. You may have heard about it. So 
as the water backed up into the bay, that Mobile River bed became the ship channel because that water was actually shallow in Mobile Bay. And uh, when the Spaniards first sailed up in there, you know, it was shallow in places and they couldn't get, couldn't get up to the land as, as well. And so schooners did okay and, and flatboats. But um, to get from, from the eastern shore of Mobile Bay over to Mobile, you got this thing called the river De Mobile River Delta. You got about seven rivers that come in there and that thing's like an Amazon. And I'm serious, it's America's Amazon. If you know, <laughs> don't know much about it, you got all this water draining out of, uh, a lot of it out of West Georgia, South Tennessee, Alabama, Eastern Mississippi, all drains in down there. And there are no roads out there for miles and miles. You, you can only get around by water. And uh, I went in there in February to an, some, an Indian mound, some Indian mounds, much like the Mayan ruins. And you can only get in there in February because you've got to cross some streams and it's too snaky. But you can get in there in February. You can take a boat way up there and get in there. But that thing has like 250 species. There's gators. There's any kind of wildlife you can imagine in there. And fauna, all kind of flora. So anyway, so it would take weeks to get from Fairhope by horse or buggy around that delta over to Mobile. Well, except for the boat coming across the bay, the flat boats. Well, uh, Fairhope has a pier, and it's out there because there's something out there called a 12-foot curve, and, any, and Fairhope had the closest point to the 12-foot curve, so they could park steamboats and bigger boat bay boats there and, and they could bring all the farming goods into Fairhope, ship them over to Mobile, and then uh, bring other goods from Mobile for all those people. So uh, the bay, but after, but up until, so from the you know, early, early 1800s to uh, 1927, when, when you had more automobiles and they built the bay way across the bay, then those bay, bay boats went away. But the roads were so bad in Baldwin County Foley, from Foley South, even as late as 1927 or 30, was sand roads and, and logs. I mean, and down on the coast, before they cut that waterway, it was just a peninsula down there, and they cut that waterway in the early 30s and made it an island, and then, of course, it's taken off. But, uh, but to say the least, uh, the more they deepened this ship channel, and this was from the Army Corps of Engineers, the more commerce comes to Mobile, the more shipping, the more shipping and stuff is going on, the better it helps commercial in downtown, et cetera, et cetera. So they're trying to get it wide enough to, so they can have two of those big Panamax ships. Because right now, one of them has to wait out in the Gulf while one comes out. You know, and, if, and a crew, the cruise ship has a right of way. So anyway, uh, but the state port authority down there is continuing to grow, and it's it's a you know real interesting facility. But uh, but Fairhope has a real interesting history, and, and Mobile, and the Grand Hotel. I just show this real quick. There's been a, as I said, there's been a, some a, a hotel on that property since 1820s. So they're at the third hotel. Storms and fires have gotten them up to this point. But this was the second one, and then the third one was the original building that's still there now. And, um, and so it was really uh, the 40s and 50s, not much going on down in Gulf Shores. And it was really after uh, Hurricane Frederick in 79 kind of wiped out. It used to have hurricanes on the coast like today. No, it wasn't a big deal because nothing got torn up. They'd go down there with chainsaws, cut the trees down, and you know, it wasn't a big deal. But now, that's right. Now, you know, it's different. But um, so I'm, I'm working on one more book. Now I'm, I'm enjoying it. It's, uh, it's going to be a memoir about with Dr. Bronner. So I'm excited about that. We're going to cover the whole thing. That's why I had a lot of this fresh on my mind today. So. Um, I'm glad to have the opportunity to come over here. Would, would anybody like to, y'all like to ask any questions, say anything? Yes, sir. Uh, I have a couple of questions. Uh, Bob. 
Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Yeah. All right. Let me let me let me see if I can tell you what uh, he gets that a lot because he gets criticized. But what you have to understand is, uh, even with the hotels, it's probably seven hundred million dollars. That's twenty six golf courses. He got it down to where he could build. Uh, 54 holes for what it cost you and me to build 18 because he didn't pay anything for the land and he, he, he bought the economy of scale of buying all the sprinkler heads, 125 miles of concrete cart path, eight feet wide, everything. So he got it built and, it, you know, um, the, the appraisals changed because... Um, Silver Lakes is not getting the play that it once did, but, but when it was built, they didn't have Capitol Hill that's getting 90,000 rounds, et cetera, et cetera. But uh, he doesn't make as much money off the golf trail as he does the hotels. Uh, but once he gets them, the golf course courses help bring them in. And once they get in, then they get them to buy food and alcoholic beverages. They get them to spend money over at the hotel. Um, he might have could have gotten a little more return on some stocks and bonds, but uh, ask him, go look at 2009, 2008, 2009. He's only, out of 45 years, he's only had four years that he had negative returns, okay? And that was, guess what? 2001 and two after 9-11 and uh, nine and 10 after uh, the financial collapse. Everybody got killed during those times. but. But he gets the economic impact, which helped. See, his idea was the stronger I can make the state of Alabama, the stronger I can make the retirement system. So much money is that $14 billion that's the statewide tourism money, lodging taxes, all kind of sales taxes, beverage taxes, et cetera, alcohol, helps to uh, shore up the general fund. So he doesn't look at it like, what's my return on investment on this course? But people that run private golf courses, now they have to look at it a little differently. And when they built a lot of those courses, you know, in the first six months, they had to, we had to have this many rounds, you know, 18 months, we gotta be doing this and that. And so a lot of those private courses have suffered. And a lot of them closed, and a lot of them are real estate now. And a lot of them have Walmarts. And seriously, that you know, it becomes it's actually pretty good property in places. Well, the follow-up to that is the golf, of all the courses, the golf is, I heard you correctly, that have a real estate component, you know, where people are actually... Oh, that they, that they use, that they, that they finance, it's RSA finances, but all the rest of them have, there have been over 8,000 houses built around by private developers, you see. That RSA actually is financing and building those two communities. But every, I mean, I'd have to look in my book, but I can tell you that if you, ever, if you were in Huntsville, if you saw Huntsville before and after that course got built, if you saw Ross Bridge, you see what I'm saying? Keep going. No, but they, they had the seed money. They put in the seed money to, to get it going and to get the deals going, you know, but... Um, so it was, I mean, it was that kind of vision. Uh, but yeah, the golf industry, you know, and, and I was at, I spoke um, two years ago actually over at the HSBC, that's Hong Kong Shanghai Bank Corporation uh, World Golf Business Forum in Ponte Vedra, Jacksonville, Florida. First time they'd been in the United States. They'd been, you know, for the first 12 years they were in uh, Shanghai, and I don't mean all over the place. Um, and everybody that was there, everybody, the Golf Channel, the Golf Foundation, the USGA, PGA, European Tour, Asian Tour, all, everybody was there, RNA, and Jack Nicholas was on the panel, and Jack Nicholas told them all, and Reese Jones was on there with him, and Jack, and Jack said, it takes too long to play golf, ball goes too far, we got to find a way to, so people can, these younger people can go play golf faster 
and less time, you know, less time, spend less money. We got to have less money to maintain these courses. We need to use less land when we build them. We got to make the ball go, you know, cut the ball back. Don't make it. Don't let it go so far. Uh, <laughs> well, that's <laughs> true. But 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 the point was the business side of this is that. But so now I don't know. Have y'all seen this Top Golf stuff? Have, have y'all seen some of that stuff? I mean, people, they go out there and they drink and eat and they hit balls and, they, you know. So, so golf has got to do, so that's why they're changing the rules and this and that. But, but yeah, a lot of golf course, the golf industry, to, to keep, and they're trying to get youth in and this and that. But, but for Alabama, it really helped with the image and it helped to get a lot of executives in here that wouldn't have come and, and the image of Alabama was like black and white photos from the 60s with police dogs and fire hoses. I mean, that's what, in 1990, things weren't going so well. Somebody said, if you hadn't have done that golf trail, Alabama would be like Mississippi without the casinos. So that was the deal. And then the other thing that, that I'm going to get into in this next book that I don't really talk about here is what Dr. Bronner did has done through the years to recruit industry to Alabama. He went to recruit Mercedes here. He visited them, he worked hard. Governor Folsom, they got the deal worked out. They worked out a big incentive package and they got them agreed in 1993 to come to Tuscaloosa. Well, the only problem was they didn't work out all the details on the, how they were gonna come up with the money they were promising them. So Bob James came in and he can't find all, he can't find the money. And so all of a sudden we're this close to welching on the deal. Well, that would have been the work, that would have set us back two, two decades probably. So Dr. Bronner stepped up with a $110 million bridge financing loan so that the deal could be put together for the state, state, you know, bought the bonds, whatever, and they got it, they got the deal secured. Well, after they got Mercedes, started getting suppliers, then they got Honda, they got Hyundai, uh, Toyota engine plant in Huntsville, Kia, right over here, and there have been over 200 suppliers supplying all kind of auto parts. Well, he did the same thing for Air Airbus down in Mobile. He recruited the Tallahassee, Alabama, GKN Industries, aerospace industry over there, and they, they started plying, uh, supplying parts for those uh, Airbus engines, whatever, and that was several years before Airbus came to Mobile. So he helped bring Airbus to Mobile, now you got the aerospace engine, uh, industry growing. So he, his vision has been more, how can I change the state? How can I get higher paying, paying jobs in here? I mean, you go look at the economy and you look Alabama, Mississippi, Arkansas, Louisiana, I mean, we're on the bottom of all just about any indicator you want to look at, exports. And in and, and 73, when he came in, we weren't exporting a whole lot of stuff, and it wasn't that much different than it was in the eight, late 1800s. Guess what we were exporting? Cotton, timber. We weren't manufacturing a whole lot of stuff. You had the Space Flight Center and Redstone Arsenal, but you had a lot of military bases around, but we didn't have a lot of high-paying jobs. So anyway, don't mean to get going, but are we, am I kind of getting at what you were talking about? Exactly, they're, they're, and I mentioned it, it's a, there's a chapter in the back of that. There are probably at least 15 other states, but what they did, they didn't construct them from scratch, they just marketed courses they already had as a trail, Audubon Trail, whatever, Pete Dye Trail in Indiana, Jerry, and, um, but what they, what uh, Tennessee did was they got Jack to come in, they built four courses, four sites in state parks. 
Well, they were pretty sites, but they weren't close enough to the infrastructure, and they didn't have the hotels like these places have, so they didn't have a real nice place to stay. Well, a couple of those didn't do so well. And so the other thing was they didn't have that publicity back in those courses. Having those media companies, and I will say this, he's, he's, in, he's already reached an agreement, and they're getting ready to close the deal probably within the next two or three months for him to sell those Raycom television stations for $3.6 billion. Plus, you see, once he bought those TV stations, they, brought, they moved their headquarters to Montgomery, and so did those newspapers. But, but he, and he's already in this new agreement, he's getting 31 million in free advertising for 10 more years, and he's, they're not moving, they agreed not to move their headquarters. So he got what he wanted, but they're getting, uh, they're getting some preferred stock and some common stock in this new company. And this new, new company out of Atlanta, the reach is going to like 20 or 25 percent of the whole U.S. It's going to be like 200 stations. So that that's working out pretty well for him. Yes, sir. Well, all right. So here's here's the deal on that. He, Dr. Bronner decided he wanted to do this, this copter. He wanted to do something to help the whole state, just like Eisenhower when he built the interstate system to help the whole country. He wanted to do something to really enhance the whole state. So he came up with this idea about, uh, uh, first he thought about four courses, and then it, it kept growing. But so being a bureaucrat, he, he wrote out what's called an RFP, Request for Proposal. Well, he sent it out to five major architects. And he said that he said I'll tell I'll name those when I'm dead or when they're dead or something, but I can imagine it was Robert Trent Jones, Arnold Palmer, Jack Nicholas, Fazio, and Pete Dye. Okay, I'm just guessing. And um, two of them, I don't know who, did not even respond. He wrote out and said, "I'm looking. You know, I'm going to build a golf trail for 100 million dollars." You know, four sites. Uh, one of them wrote him back and said, ah, this is something that needs to be done by private. You don't really need to be getting into this. And, you know, and, and then uh, something else similar to that. And one, and Trent Jones picked up the phone and called him. And Trent Jones had, had done probably, you know, he'd been building courses since the 18, uh, 1930s, mid-30s. And... Um, already had like a, you know, over a 50 year career at that time. And, and I'll tell you this, the saying is the sun never sets on a Trent Jones course. <laughs> what that means is he's got golf courses in every time zone around the world. I mean, Japan, South America, all over Europe, Spain, the Middle East. Uh, Hanson's book from, from Auburn here talks about him and his works. It's a good book about Jones himself. But, um, so when I was at, I told you I was on the agenda with Jack Nicholas over there a couple years ago, and Jack said, that's a good looking book. And I said, will you sign my book, Jack? And he said, sure. So he signed it, and um, I said, did Dr. Bronner, Jack 76 at the time, I said, did Dr. Bronner write you and ask you to do the golf trail? And Jack looked at me and said, I don't know. <laughs> so I think it helps a lot. Just because he designed all these U.S. Open courses and Bronner wanted all, every side on this golf trail, he wanted to be able to host the U.S. Open. He was looking for pristine golf. So I think it helped a lot. But one more, and then I'll come to you. Yes, sir. Right. Exactly. Oh, well, no, I, here's, I don't think he, he's 73. He's been there 45 years. He's 28 when he got to Montgomery. And I, I think he's done building golf courses. Uh, he, the, first, the first ones he had to build near an urban area, so that's why they picked Huntsville, Birmingham. He couldn't find a site he liked in Montgomery, which is what brought him over here, basically, and Mobile. 
And then, because he had to sustain play until they could get the tourism going, then they went to those more remote sites to get the, you know, once they got it rolling. But over in West Alabama, I mean, the shows was a hard place to get to. No interstate up there, and, you know, it's just, it was just hard to get to up there. So he was slow getting up there, but it turned out to be a real pretty side on the river and a good situation. And so, but he's looked at over near Tuscaloosa and um, over in there, and the population's just not there. They couldn't find a site he liked in Tuscaloosa, and he had all those in Birmingham, and it's only two hours from Prattville, so I, it just didn't work out, you know. He wanted to build a hotel over there, and they couldn't agree on a site downtown close to the river down there. I then I said, See, I love, I mean, you, you hear that, I love those stories. You hear that stuff, it's, it's the honest truth. <laughs> Even funnier. Even funnier. Yeah. You get the, you get, yeah, it's a, it, that I love hearing that. Yes, it is true, and they're probably playing better courses unless you go, unless you remember at East Lake or Atlanta. I mean Atlanta Athletic Club. I don't mean to diss the Atlanta courses, but I'm saying a lot of them aren't near this quality. Yeah, those that can be that you can afford. <laughs> yes. They do fundraisers at these places, and it, I don't know. I mean, it's, it's just meant a lot, but um, anybody got anything else? Well, I, I really appreciate y'all. Yes, sir, Jerry. All right. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, he, you know, he he de he's been dealing with that stuff since he's been there. Here's the point: these officials get elected and to solve a problem, and they're only in there four or eight years. And um, so the problem is, we don't have enough money in this state. Our taxes are low. We don't have a re we don't have a lottery. We don't have reasonable property taxes. I'm serious, you know. So so we don't have a lot of revenue. So they they try to find revenue, and all of a sudden this retirement money pops up over here. Well, the governor uh, gets to a point. They have some ad hoc members to members of each board. The, there are two boards: ERS board and a TRS board. And so they 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 get to the finance directors on there, and, and you know few others and so they try to get on the investment committee and they try to gain control because they'd like to say oh I think we ought to invest 500 million dollars over here in off Alabama we could use a so-and-so over there I mean you know kind of politically motivated type thing so uh, so he's had to fight that well 
uh, the legislature would pass cost of living increases for retirees and they wouldn't fund it. Well, that goes back, that affects his funding ratio. That means he's got to find high. So, uh, but then the latest thing has been uh, there's real money behind uh, this Co Koch Brothers, KOCH, Arnold Foundation, Pew Foundation, real money. I mean, millions and billions of dollars, and they fund research institutes around the country, universities, to study um, public pension plans. See, there's several, there's a probably three, at least three trillion dollars in public pension plans out there right now. So it's big money, and they want them to go from defined benefit, which all these fire, firemen, state troopers, all kind of people that work hard every day that don't have, you know don't make a whole lot of money, but they have a benefit to look forward to. They uh, they contribute and they get it. They got a benefit. Now the the fine contribution is you put your money in, you manage it like a 401k, and you might have something down here and you might not. And if you don't know how to manage it, you're gonna have to pay somebody to manage it. Well, there's a lot of management fees involved with those. Uh, those, if, it, if they could get them all to go to 401k. But here's my question, if, the, if they're all so interested in that, why don't, they, why don't they tackle Social Security? Okay, you wanna see something that's got problems? Social Security, and I say that, but there are no fees involved. That's why, the, and so they get, they contribute this money and, they, and people do studies that come back. But I'll tell you this, uh, a lot of states have gone from defined contribution, excuse me, defined benefit to defined contribution, like West, uh, Kentucky, West Virginia. They go back. They went back because it, uh, they didn't have people paying in and their funding ratio got worse and worse. What I mean by the funding ratio is the accrued liability. Let's just say if you had, uh, if you, you have all these members, and if they all had to be paid at one time what their benefit was, would you have enough money to pay them? And when he started, they had 25% of what they needed. There have been years when they've had 100% now, but it comes back some. When you have a bad year in the economy, investments don't do as well, or they pass these cost of living increases, different things affect that funding ratio. And he says, Somewhere around 80, 85 percent is the sweet spot. If you get too high, they want to give raises, and so um, so that's what it is. That's what he has to deal with. And they changed the system to they, now they have tier one and tier two. So uh, that was a few years back. They had they had a committee that looked at it, and they totally uh, changed the law. And he agreed that was the best thing to do to try to save it, but. Um, but you'll have it every year. You'll have it all the time. And, and so they try to keep the 350,000 members. You know, we all, we've got almost 5 million people in this state, 4.8 million people. And so that's about 7% of the population that are members of that system. And if they really organized, they could, they could be a political block vote, you know. We'll see. I really appreciate getting to see y'all. War Eagle. That's coming pretty good from a guy that went to the University of Alabama now. Y'all got to admit.